I'm a scholar of religion, not an historian. Um, and my central question as a scholar of religion, um, from the time I started my career, way back MA even, before my PhD, is what happens to a religion when it moves from a place of origin or origins to a new location. That's always been, that, that informs all my work. Um, and I came to Islam via that route. I mean, in, in a sense, Islam was my model for what, what happens to it um, when it moves. Um, and of course, we've, we've already debated many, many issues around which Islam and which group of Muslims and, and so on. Um, when I, I should have really have put the challenge to create a British Islam, British Islam should really have been in quotes. Because I'm going to be using British Islam very specifically and there are three terms, it seems to me, that get mixed up, but they should be very clear, um, at least in the way I use them. Um, the first is British Islam, which I'm going to be using as a particular term which gained currency among a generation born and raised in Britain in the early um, 1990s, perhaps we can question that. Um, and Islam in Britain, which I think is a much, much wider term and, and, and would refer to all, all aspects of, 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 of how the religion manifests itself, how Muslims live it in their daily lives. Um, and I think there's also perhaps you could, a, a more contentious term, Islamic Britain. And, and I've already, in a sense, in, in, in my intervention in the earlier talks, um, um, Professor Ansari, uh, that it seems to me that those that are interested in British Islam um, have to come clean, whether they're 19th century or 21st century, that they are ultimately interested in an Islamic Britain. Um, how you get there, that's, and how you do it, um, that, that, that's going to have a huge amount of, of variation. I'm looking at the 1880-1938 period, um, not because I'm going to talk about, I am going to talk about Abdullah Quilliam, he's, he's quintessential in this, but I'm also going to take it forward um, to the Woking um, Muslim uh, community uh, and, and the arrival of the Indian missionaries um, from um, Kadian, um, who are crucial for the next period after Quilliam. And, try and what I'm going to try and map in a way is how this term, and it, they may not be using the term British Islam, but how this idea of a British Islam, in fact, Quilliam always refers to an English Islam, I may add, but um, he, he was a Liverpudlian. <laughs> But um, how, how that is contested and mapped out in this earlier period. So in other words, there are, it, it has its roots in debates and discussions that were beginning to, um, well in fact they were taking a lot of attention um, of both the, the converts um, and the, uh, the missionaries. And sometimes those discussions between the missionaries and the converts were not easy. So, so saying that, I'm going to define how I'm using British Islam, because I think that's absolutely pin it down. Um, and the way I'm going to be using it is, as a term was beginning to gain currency amongst a generation born and raised in Britain, even as in the early uh, 1990s, and found institutional expression with the advent of, of the Islamic Society of Britain, ISB, and a number of other Muslim organizations. In this position, Islam is paramount and moderates over and determines the context and shape of ethnic and national identity. The advantage of this approach um, was that Islam was perceived as a universal identity that could be allied with any national loyalty and a primary identity that provided a global ethic and a code of behavior that transcended locality. So very specific. Although Quilliam never had to engage with those three identities, that is ethnicity, national identity, and Islam, he certainly had to engage heavily with two of them, um, which would have been his national identity and Islam. He never had a problem with, with the ethnic identity, unless you think of him as being a Manxman, but I don't think that ever, <laughs> being a Manxman or a Liverpudlian never really um, was a, a major issue for him in terms of the Islam he practiced. But he did have to draw together the various constituencies that formed the backgrounds um, of the users of the Liverpool Mosque. Um, and he drew upon Ottomanism 
um, to emphasize the internationalization of Islam rather than the idea of British or European Islam. Um, as I say, his personal identities were Liverpudlian and Manx. Quilliam was English and Muslim in a period of colonial tensions between the country of his birth and the religion of his choice. And Quilliam was convinced that only English Muslims could successfully establish Islam in Britain. In this context, a brief observation might be made, actually, I, I won't go there. Um, Quilliam's espousal of a British Islam was straightforward. Firstly, Muslims born in Britain would be able to establish Islam that did not carry cultural baggage from elsewhere in the Muslim majority world. The second point is not unconnected. In order to avoid carrying a cultural baggage, a Muslim had to practice that faith from conviction rather than by birth. As he noted in 1896, English Muslims have adopted the faith, not for personal advantage, but because they believe it to be true. And the world will then know how to appreciate these courageous men and women who gave who have boldly made a stand for truth. Such a position might not preclude all Muslims who were part of the Ummah through birth, but they would need to go through similar processes to the converts. In other words, a conscious re-examination of their commitment to Islam. The first Imam of the Liverpool Muslim Institute was actually an Indian. Um, Barakatullah, um, very famous in his own right, um, and he reiterated um, Quilliam's position uh, in the sense of referring to the decline of Muslim countries, that they were in a time of crisis, and therefore true Islam would revive from the West um, and not from the East. Uh, from him, education of the masses has been neglected, superstition has prevailed all over Islamic countries, Democracy is crushed down under the feet of despotism. It is time now for the son of Islam to arise from the West. Another prominent figure of the time, um, a South African, Haji Mohammed Dolly, who, who sent, uh, set up, um, who tried to create a mosque in London, um, establishing the Ajimani um, Islami, um, also um, took up the same position as, as Quilliam and Barakatullah. Uh, and at the time of um, the opening of the London Temporary Mosque, uh, he was to say um, in his opening remarks, well, cer certainly as reported by um, Quilliam's newspaper, The Crescent anyway, in his opening remarks um, to dedicate this new prayer space in London, that he wanted proselytization done in a way that would make sense to the British, including possibly employing um, a hymn book and a prayer book in English, and even providing pews in the mosque. The reality is that Quilliam, of course, and these other figures were deeply enmeshed in the politics of the Muslim world. The Liverpool Muslim community was in touch with, glo with, a, with a global awareness um, of a Muslim sense of crisis and felt it was part, that it was itself part of an Islamic revival um, that was occurring at the time. The Muslim presence in the second city of the empire and also in London provided a sense of being a part of the mobilization of the true religion, both for the converts and for the Muslims who lived in parts of the world where European domination was felt. Quilliam was always clear, let, let's make no bones about it, that his ultimate ambition and the goal to which he worked was the final victory of Islam. Even though he may have considered Islam the religion, a religion or the religion of reason, he did not believe in the westernization of the Muslim world, but rather the opposite. Quilliam struggled for the Islamiz Islamization of the West. Quilliam believed in the Ummah, and as such he was aware that there could be no Islam that was purely regional and only responded to local conditions. When it came to conflict between the West and the Islamic majority world, Quilliam would proclaim in a fatwa, harm one Muslim, 
and you harm us all. In 1908, Abdullah Quilliam left Liverpool for Constantinople, only to return to Britain in 1912, where he recreated himself as Henri de Leon and became an active participant in the new initiative to establish Islam in Britain, inspired by the Ahmadiyya missionaries in Woking and London. Some of the middle-class male converts inspired to embrace Islam by Quilliam would be in London too, hoping to form a nexus of converts who would join with others, such as Marmaduke Pickthel, Lord Headley, um, we've already seen um, uh, Lady Kobold, um, and that out of that they hoped to form a community of Muslims. Even the key element of continuity between Quilliam and the Liverpool Muslim Institute, however the key element of continuity and the other active converts such as Sheldrake and, and Parkinson that would include the new converts such as Headley, was the need to create an Islam that molded itself to British life. Arguably, this was deemed to be British upper class um, life, as one difference between the Woking mission and the Liverpool mission was, the, was class. Quilliam had been able to reach the working classes, both native Liverpudlians and the Laskers, um, as well as prominent members of upper classes. But Kamaluddin, the lawyer and upper class um, Indian, who had arrived as the first missionary um, in 1912, was most successful with his own class in British society. In the main, the WMM consisted of upper-class educated Indians, especially London University students, and British converts from the upper levels of society. Generally, the work of the WMM was carried out in English. Dress codes were lax, um, in that normal British dress was worn, even um, at time of prayer. Women and men mixed freely, following the conventions of British Edwardian life, rather than those of India or the Middle East. And despite the rivalry with Christianity, Islamic terminology was Christianized. For example, the Quran became the Islamic Bible, um, the mosque was the Muslim church, and the minbar was called the pulpit. Men and women prayed together in the mosque at Woking. The attitude towards Christianity was that of tolerance, at least to the degree that Christianity and Judaism were promoted as companion monotheistic religions from the same God and with the same prophets. However, the current condition of Christianity was argued to be a deviation from the original faith of Jesus, and Islam was presented in contrast to Christianity as a religion of reason, classless, tolerant, more in tune with the spirit of the age. Jamie Gillam describes the WMM's missionaries as promoting a rational, liberal, syncretic form of Anglo-Islam which caught the attention of enough Britons to spur them on. Professor Ansari notes that Islam was pre presented as a progressive moral force, an adopting approach with which audiences would be familiar. He states, Islam needed to be made indigenous as it had been elsewhere. It could not expand if it was perceived as alien or exotic religion practiced by people whose traits the majority population regarded as inferior. These Muslims trod delicately. And Kamaluddin, as a, as a, as a British educated Indian, of, um, a lawyer uh, of, of, of high class, or certainly high middle class, was able to play that role to perfection. The missionaries discovered new ways of communicating Islam that departed from traditional arguments and style of fiqh um, that, that were, um, and which were far more familiar to Western educated audiences. The train of thought was more likely to be supported by quotations from Western writers, scientists and philosophers than Islamic act scholars. Yet, like Quilliam and, and they critiqued the validity of the Christian scriptures, the doctrines of incarnation and atonement, seen out of kilter with the spirit of reason and challenged common misconceptions of Islam, especially gender issues, slavery, polygamy and jihad. In spite of Kamaluddin's reluctance towards foreign Islamic missionaries working in London and his patient efforts to build an Islam that converged with British society, which had encouraged him to create new organizations and promotional literature, independent from India, 
his success had been noted and celebrated there. For both Kamaluddin and his religious compatriots in India, a prophecy made by their founder was being fulfilled based on the hadith that, the, that the, the, um, the sun will rise in the West. The son of Islam was indeed interpreted as rising in the West. This would lead to the Ahmadiyya leadership sending out more missionaries to work with Kamaluddin. Volunteers were requested to assist the missionaries in London, in India, and also in other places abroad, and funds were sought for membership in India to finance the cost of travel. In 1913, Chowdhury Fatah Muhammad Sayal joined um, Kamaluddin in Woking and began to work with him. Sayal, like Kamaluddin, belonged to the elite group of followers who had joined Ahmed as a young man and felt compelled to dedicate their lives in the cause of reviving Islam. Also, as Kamaluddin, he belonged to an elite class of Indian Muslims educated in British schools. By now, Kamaluddin had established a method of communicating Islam in London and elsewhere in Britain. And it would appear that Sayal would fit into the pattern of preaching devised by the earlier missionary. But there were indications that all was not well between them. At the age of 43, Kamaluddin was the older man and a successful barrister. And it was his mission which he had begun. In this sense, he had successfully initiated it, gained control of Woking Mosque, and made inroads into British society and gained the respect of the existing British converts. Woking had become the effective centre of activities for organising Islam in Britain. Kamaluddin's conviction that Islam in Britain had to find a way to accommodate itself to British society had resulted in the establishment of the Woking Muslim Mission, the Islamic Review, um, and his new British organisations and its journal reflect Kamaluddin's conviction shared with Abdullah Quilliam that foreign Islamic missionaries were not the best suited to culturally transmit Islam in Britain. However, it would seem also that the new missionaries from Qadian had some misgivings with the liberality of the Islam practiced by some converts at Woking. Bowen's identification of a liberal or non-conformist tendencies amongst the converts would chime with versions of Islam put forward by both Quilliam in Liverpool and Kamaluddin in Woking. Both men were free from any other authority to develop a very liberal version of Islam where dress codes were lax, the concerns over fiqh as prominent amongst the Ulma of India and elsewhere in the Muslim world were almost non-existent, drinking of alcohol was tolerated to a degree, at least in Lord Headley's case, food rules were lax, and sometimes even salat was not observed. Quilliam may have been more orthodox in practice than some of the members of the Woking community, but he was still free from any other authority in his negotiating of Islam and early 20th century British life. However, this was not the case with the London missionaries that arrived from Qadian. They were under the authority of a caliph, whose numbers of followers amongst Indian Hanafi Muslims was increasing day by day. For the first time in the history of Islam in Britain, a major missionary movement was controlled by Indian leadership with authority located in India itself. Quilliam may have had a religious loyalty and personal affinity with Abdul Hamid II, but the Ottoman Sultan and Sunni Caliph had no direct authority over the decisions of their appointed Sheikh of Islam in Britain. This was not the case with the new missionaries from Qadian. At the time of Eid in the early summer of 1920, the newly arrived missionary, Nayar, had complained that most people in London considered Christianity in only a few basic principles, and therefore practiced Islam the same way. He goes on to say that they do not understand that Islam is a complete way of life and needs a complete transformation. This conflict over total emergence into an Islamic way of life would conflate with interpretations of Islam and was apparent from early on in the activities of the two groups of missionaries. In September 1914, Sayal wrote that he had received a letter from Maud Etridge, who had converted to Islam in Woking, requesting to be taught prayers in Arabic as she only knew how to conduct Salat in English. In 1924, a companion of the second caliph, during the visit to London, refused to shake hands with a woman and caused great offence. 
Although her female associates came to respect his religious sensitivities, some British women came to hold a meeting with the Caliph to complain. These issues of gender separation were particularly sensitive in an age when the suffragette movement was at its height or beginning to be. Woking, on the other hand, did not practice such purdah and allowed men and women to pray together in the mosque. 1924, Nayar was asked if he would teach the women of Europe to practice purda like his own wife. He replied that the God of Europe had instructed all women to do likewise in the Christian scriptures, and he declared that he would preach purda, but of course it was up to the women of Britain to obey. In the summer of 1917, Sayal had noted that in London, his Muslim garb was not was an advertisement for Islam. He disagreed with Kamaluddin on this matter, who objected to the green turban and some young members of the movement had suggested a British hat. Sayal rejects both points of view and argues that his turban is a symbol of Islam and has curiosity value to attract people to ask questions when they see him walking in the park. Interestingly, he states, that if we leave this behind in this new country, then there is nothing left that differentiates Islam from the culture here. There may have also been keen differences with regard to the acceptance of Christianity and Islamic exclusivism. Mufti Sadiq, another missionary, reports in his biography that whenever he passed the church, he would recite the kalima and pronounce the words, may the name of God be remembered here. In a conversation with Lady Lytton, the president of the Theosophical Society, the second caliph of the Ahmadiyya movement dispels her notions of a universal religion. In response to her question, was his religion universal? He replies, there is no need to create a new religion. We call everyone towards Islam. The terminology universal religion is not right. Islam is the universal religion. Islam is for the whole world, and we are calling towards that religion. What are the fundamental principles? Those of Islam. The move towards orthodox practice amongst the new missionaries would require instruction for the new converts. In 1920, Al Faisal reports the opening of the Madrasa Al Sina Eyes, Shakia in London, and advertised in the Times. In 1926, after the opening of the new mosque, it is reported that focus is now on the organization of education of the new English converts. To this effect, a regular class was held every week on Saturdays and Sundays in which the doctrines of Islam, the five pillars, and the teachings of how to learn recital of the Quran in Arabic were taught. The notification proudly note announces that one new convert has learnt the Azan. The London missionaries shift towards an Islamic orthodoxy more in li line with the practice that as they knew in India's Hanafi traditions would have mixed reactions amongst the existing converts. The community of Muslim converts was relatively small and both sets of missionaries, those who favored what became known as the Lahoris and the Qadianis, were skilled speakers on the various aspects of Islam and both delivered the topics that had been identified in the best defense of Islam against European criticism. Unlike Quilliam, a Liverpool lawyer and journalist, the new missionaries were from India, native-born Muslims familiar with the worldview, food and languages of the voyages to Britain, trained in classical Islam and able to celebrate the rituals and festivals of Islam in a manner expected of religious leaders. In addition to being the main exponents of Tagli in the interwar period, the missionaries from Ahmadiyya highlights the contemporary challenge of trying to establish Islam in Britain in a way that is transferable to a non-Muslim Western post-Christian secular democracy now. The Ahmadiyya missionaries were not able to resolve this issue successfully, but the challenges they faced are familiar, to, are familiar still to this day. In the obituary to Lord Headley, published in the Muslim Times, Dard, um, one of the missionaries, later missionaries, poses the question that he declares was central to the Muslim peers' lifelong attempt to establish Islam in Britain. How can the Muslim faith be westernized so as to bring it into practical touch with the nations of Europe? Headley's version of the essentials of Islam were doctrinal. That is, firm belief in the one God and surrender to his own almighty will. Belief in the message divine sent through his holy prophets and the carrying into effect of the highest order of beneficence 
to all our fellow creatures on this earth. However, this Abrahamic ecumenism did not include Islamic ritual practices or the restrictions of India. <laughs> you can read that at your own leisure. Um, if you insist on Yorkshire or indeed any British farmer giving up his dish of bacon and eggs or his glass of beer, a diet which has been found very wholesome for many generations, and tell him that its continuance is going to jeopardize his chances of salvation, you will fail to convince him of the breadth and sincerity of Islam. <laughs> Dard comments, no true Muslim will ever agree with him in the westernization of Islam on the above lines. If British farmers do not worship Bacchus, and if the busy city men clad in expensive clothes do not worship Mammon, they can easily make arrangements for Muslim prayers provided they're otherwise convinced of the beauty and excellence of the Islamic mode of worship. Although devout Sunni Muslim converts such as Quilliam, Sheldrake and Parkinson would seek to find an Islam that was adaptable to British life, it was not at the expense of Islamic practice that they knew were at the heart of the religion. Other converts, especially those at Woking, would move towards Islamic strictures, especially at, apparently at odds with British norms more gradually but with the recognition that being a Muslim required such adherence to fasting, prayer, and zakat, perhaps even dress codes and gender restrictions. Others, on the other hand, considered such practices to be cultural and even argued they were not found in the Quran. For example, at the end of August 1924, during the Caliph's visit, a convert named Lawgrave had come to the mission and conversed with Sayal, one of the missionaries. He had argued that the Ramadan fast, Salat, Purdah, and polygamy were not obligatory and, and denied they were in the Quran. The meeting had initiated a consultation committee on Tbilig with the Caliph presiding. It has to be assumed that the Caliph insisted upon a more orthodox approach to Islamic practice. Certainly less than a month later, the Caliph would gather together some convert women and try to convince them of the virtues of polygamy, Purdah, and robustly defended the practice of men not shaking hands with women. Both Woking and London missionaries used the growing in interest in esotericism to seek converts, speaking in spiritualist, theosophical, and other such gatherings. An interest in the exotic included the Orient, fueled by alternative religious worldviews to Christianity, Romanticism, and even fantasy. It is almost inevitable that Islam in Britain would begin to appeal to such an audience, with the added familiarity of Abrahamic monotheism, as opposed to Hindu or Buddhist worldviews. There were also those who had had real contact with the Middle East and India through travel or service in the empire. In these cases, the motives of conversion were different and likely to permit a genuine embracing of Islamic practices. Woke intended to be more tolerant of idiosyncratic mixes of Islamic and British lifestyles, whereas the London missionaries were more strict. Responding to the attitude of Rankin um, uh, in defense of the British Ahmadiyya movement, was made in the Muslim Times, probably written by Mubarak, Mubarak Fulin, a convert. According to the principles, people who enter the fold of Islam, who publicly and openly embrace the religion of the Holy Prophet of Mecca, must do so wholeheartedly and sincerely, and must make it the foundation of their lives. Until a few years ago, the British Muslims were fed like sheep in all matters that affected Islam. Today, the position of many of them is not much better. Any man coming from the East, affecting a beard, or speaking Arabic, is considered a past master in Islamic thought. The result is that when he says fasting is only for those who are in their own country, that prayer is not always necessary, that Islam can accommodate the voices of the West, the British enthusiast often follows without a murmur. With the deaths of Kamaluddin, Marmaduke Pixthal, and Abdullah Quilliam in the 1930s, British Muslims lost three of the most skilled practitioners of Islam in Britain, able to translate orthodox Muslim adherence into an early 20th century British context, attempting not to compromise the tenets of the faith. Others were to find it more difficult, polarizing into various camps, orthodox, heterodox. The writer of the same article that I've just quoted encapsulates the challenge for British Muslims succinctly and unknowingly highlights an issue that remains central to British Muslims today. Islam was revealed in the East. This, however, does not mean that Britishers can never be pioneers of Islam. The English people do not want Indian Islam, Egyptian Islam, Arabian Islam, or society Islam 
They want the Islam of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, the Islam of Hazrat al Bakr. Um, goodness, I'm going to of the ladies Khadija and Aisha, and of the companions of the Holy Prophet. And I'll finish that there. <laughs>